Hi, it's Dr. Shelley. And the moment you've been waiting for, the moment I've been promising you is here. Remember a few weeks ago when we did the video on your candidate report, if you ever failed NCLEX, and we talked about how to read that report, and we also talked about what is the number one area of failure. In fact, I remember that I showed you this report, and I showed you how basic care and comfort right here is the number one area of failure and if you look at this this is actually a student who discovered my videos a week before her test wish she had discovered them before that because she got all of the bugs just studying my ngn new nclex material on my hetv youtube channel but here you can see she did fail and she failed again in the number one area of failure so today we're going to help all of you understand what in the hell does it mean when we say basic care and comfort. Basic care and comfort, what I did was I made three columns basically of everything that goes under basic care and comfort. What I did is I wanted you to understand that in summary, the, the, the basic care and comfort phrase, I guess, it really means how do you distinguish yourself as different from a doctor or a pharmacist. So if I'm asking you about constipation and you tell me that I need to get a stool softener or a laxative, you're gonna fail the test in that section because what you should have said was increase movement or mobility like activity, um, drink more fluids, high fiber diet, that would have been a basic care and comfort answer. If the patient is post-op and they just had surgery and you have them um, trying to recover and you say to um, the patient, okay, your pulse ox is dropping, I need you to take some deep breaths and uh, give me a cough, that's basic care and comfort. That's how are you, the nurse, going to take care of this patient? If your patient has, for example, heartburn or GERD, right? Uh, gastrointestinal reflux disorder or gastroesophageal, my bad, gastroesophageal reflux disorder. If your patient has GERD and you reach for uh, Nexium or Protonics, uh, you know, pantoprazole or esomeprazole or whatever, you reach for those medications, Prilosec, whatever, then you're gonna fail that section of the NCLEX because what should have happened is you should have told them that most GERD is based on obesity and a weight loss program would improve it, but until then, you need to not go to bed three hours, within three hours of eating. You need to avoid tight clothing around your abdomen, your belly area. You need to make sure that you stay away from spicy or citrusy or tomatoey or acidic foods. Um, you know, you need to you need to do teaching. We do teaching. That's how one of the ways we differ from a doctor or a pharmacist. So once I show you this basic care and comfort approach, you'll know that once you get a question on your NCLEX exam in that area, to stop right there and make sure you don't go answer quickly to the medication of choice, but instead you start thinking, what would I do for this condition with no medication at all? Now don't get it twisted. Part of basic care and comfort is pain management. So yeah, you are gonna use medications in that situation. And also part of basic care and comfort is over the counter medications, meaning you should know whether or not a patient should take Tylenol versus Motrin. You should know whether or not a patient should take Zyrtec or Allegra. You should know whether a patient should take um, by their child a fever reliever over the counter or maybe do some basic care and comfort. So let's go, let's do it, let's get busy. Uh, again, let me just say a review that the candidate report that a student gets if they fail the NCLEX is going to say the different subjects that they failed in. And by far, and I did leave it on the board from our last video, by far the number one area of failure is basic care and comfort and followed by 
reduction of risk, safety and infection, management of care, pharmacology, and psych. Okay, I hope that helps somebody out there. So let's go. Here we have hygiene and mouth care. You must know that if you get a question on your test about a patient on a ventilator, mouth care is a very high basic care and comfort priority. Brushing the teeth is included in that. Hygiene can be anything from changing the bed linen to a bed bath to um, making sure that the patient gets a shower if they choose, whatever it is, boom, basic care and comfort. Let's move on. Diets, nutrition, and hydration. Now, by now, a lot of you know that when I first opened my YouTube HETV account, I just wanted you guys to know all the things that we have available. So we're giving away, you know, oh my God, packets. Well, that's going to end soon. So if you never got your oh my God packet, you better say something because I'm still giving these away. Pretty soon you will need to purchase them through our Shelly's NCLEX Prep Shop. Now, why am I showing you the Oh My God packet? Because this next one, diet, nutrition, and hydration. Diet, nutrition, and hydration are sections right here in the Oh My God packet. So I'll show you a couple things. In fact, when I look at this board full of basic care and comfort topics, almost everything on the board is in this one packet, which, you know, is pretty freaking cool. So here we go your diets and nutrition is right there, right in the Oh My God packet. This is so important because so many um, conditions, and I'll give you three right off the grip, that is basic care and comfort, kidney failure, gout, cardiac. You have to know nutrition for those three things. For example, you have to know with gout, that certain foods will literally trigger or aggravate the gout condition. You have to know um, with diets and nutrition, the hydration section on here as well is just as important because part of basic care and comfort is understanding how to hydrate the patient, whether it's oral or IV, and to prevent dehydration in the first place. That's just basic care and comfort. You see, it's not the doctor that starts the IV, that starts the fluids, that regulates the rate, that monitors the site. No, it's us. So this is huge. It even kind of overlaps a little bit with IV therapy, okay? So we'll talk about that. So that's huge, huge, big. Did I say it was huge? I hope so, because like it's huge. All right, now the next one is something that I bet you, my love, underestimate the need for sleep. Well, <laughs> you're in nursing school, you don't get any sleep, but your patient still needs sleep. So sleep promotion for basic care and comfort, the room needs to be cooled down to 68 degrees. The lights need to be completely out. The television off. I know what you do at your house. I'm talking about your patient. I'm talking about a test. The television needs to be completely out. Blue light exposure, which is your phone, your laptop, your any digital device needs to be avoided three hours before it because that blue light will stimulate the retina and decrease the natural production of melatonin. Okay, you feeling me yet? So instead of giving your patient a sleeping pill, basic care and comfort is how do you promote sleep? Waking up at the same time every single day, every single morning is part of sleep promotion. Getting up and opening up the curtains, the blinds, everything letting every little tiny bit of sunshine in and if you live in ohio that's five days worth um getting that sunshine in the room so the patient knows the difference between day and night okay so that's sleep promotion no exercising immediately before bed because guess what you'll be all hyped up like i am when i get done doing some squats and working out and doing some lifts and dancing and uh, i'm sorry moving on Elimination and calf care. You must understand how to help a patient have regular bowel movements, um, how to make sure the urinary system stays free of infection, how to make sure if they have a catheter, you're taking care of it. That's all under basic care and comfort. And when you think about just 
helping a patient go to the bathroom every day. I just read an article, because you gotta read. Once you leave your nursing school, your learning is not over. I learn something new every damn day, baby, because I want to be the shit, okay? I wanna be the best reviewer in the world for you, because your license depends on it. So you never stop learning. But I just read the other day that if you're not pooping once a day, you have a very high rate of dementia. And I believe that because those toxins and poisons are right in your body still. They need to come out. Like get the shit out. So here, increased fluids, increased movement, high fiber diet, and just the awareness that you should probably be going more than once every week is a big deal. Okay, so this is a big deal for your patient. Calf care, I don't have to tell you calf care, you know how to do calf care. But remember prevention of a UTI, right? Wiping from front to back is basic care and comfort. Um, cutting back on the pop and the, the iced teas, the bladder irritants is basic care and comfort, like decrease that coffee intake, increase the water intake. Um, you know, just stuff like that, like it's, it's all basic care. So I'm being brief, but you get it. All right, next on the list, mobility and positioning. I, of course, have pink packets for everything. If you take advantage of our pink packet study guides, there's like all the pink packets in the world, including, oh my God, and procedures or whatever, you could see right on the back of this, there's your positionings. But that's not all. If you open it up, I have even more positions. Okay, so positioning, you should never underestimate because they are on that test, right? So you should understand when it comes to positioning, what position is needed for respiratory distress, what positioning is needed for a lumbar puncture. You should know, for example, that when you're getting a patient ready for an enema, or a colonoscopy that they need to be in their left lateral sims position you should know that respiratory failure or respiratory issues is semi followers and higher you should know that when a patient comes out of thyroid surgery they are sitting up okay mobility oh mobility is huge my God, you should be toileting patients every two hours, which is kind of included in mobility, but you should also know that if you cannot get a patient up, it's passive and a little bit of active range of motion combined. For some of our spinal cord injury patients, quadriplegics, it's passive range of motion. Those are huge. And just remember what I always teach you. If you don't use it, you will lose it. So if one muscle area of your body is not really like moving, you're gonna lose that muscle. You're gonna cause bed rest patients get muscle wasting because there's no contraction and relaxation of the muscle. So that's what we mean by passive range of motion. And so mobility and positioning is part of your basic care and comfort, okay? Moving on. You wouldn't think it, but OMG, post-mortem care is absolutely basic care and comfort. So if you're, when you're, because we're all going to die, when your patient dies, you must know how to properly prepare the body for the morgue um, because when you don't, that directly impacts the family's adjustment and grief process. So um, you need to know that there's so many changes that occur in the body once you die that closing the eyes right away is huge. Uh, rolling a washcloth under the chin to keep the mouth closed is huge. Making sure that there's proper identification of this patient because mistakes have happened. Um, taking everything dirty and ugly and unsightly out of the room and cleaning the room and bringing in clean linens and putting under, put pads under the body. All of this stuff, making sure the arms are on top of the sheets. All of these things are huge. Knowing when to remove the lines, the IV lines, the Foley, the NG, the uh, chest tubes, whatever it is, all these tubes patients have. Knowing not to do anything with those if there's going to be an autopsy. That's under post- mortem care, safety, restraints, and the alternatives to restraints. You already know 
and I'll be back in a second, but you already know that restraints are a huge area on the NCLEX exam. And I told you that the pink packet study guides has every little pink packet that I'm kind of showing you has all this basic care and comfort in it. Um, and so when you look at this, this particular issue is right here in great detail in the management of care packet, okay? So my pink packet study guide, I think it's 75 bucks, is the best bang for the buck, truly. Don't worry, it's going up in price, trust me. Cause I'm trying to tell y'all this stuff is very underpriced, okay? So I'm trying to get you together. Get the shit now. <laughs> All right, now, so that's that. Now, we've covered one column, right? So now we're on to this column and it's still basic care and comfort that you have to know. So let's look at palliative care versus hospice. The biggest mistake students make is confusing those two terms. They are similar and the care, the actual care may be very much alike, but they're different in terms of who needs what. So remember that hospice is a certification for six months life expectancy. So if the patient's been diagnosed with any number of um, conditions where their life is going to be shortened and we kind of know based on when, not know, because we never know God's in charge, don't get it twisted. But we kind of think based on everyone else um, everyone else's experience with that condition, we believe that they're not gonna be alive long. What kind of conditions would those be? Well, lung cancer, right? Ovarian cancer, pancreatic cancer, those three things. Um, oh, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, which is ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease. Uh, psh, from the day you're diagnosed, you only live two years from that point, right? Typically. So that's where hospice care takes over. Now you do need to know hospice is done in a hospital or a house or a long-term care facility or wherever it wants to be done at. It's not a place, it's a type of care. It's an end of life care and it's interdisciplinary, it has great team approach. And frankly, because my papa went to heaven, I, when we used hospice with Western Reserve, we just felt like that was the best experience ever in our lives. They got it down to a fine science, when to go pick up my daughter from college, um, which was about two or three hours away. They can tell you when your loved one is, you know, transitioning to heaven, and that really helped. And then they kept in touch with my mama, six months, three months, one year, not just the year of his death, but important dates like their anniversary when she was grieving. So these are things that matter that you know, that's what hospice does. And there's, they're very responsible for the pain management and even the equipment in the home. So hospice set up the bed in the home. Hospice set up all the supplies in the home. That's hospice. Palliative care is also what we do with hospice patients, but it doesn't have to be done with end of life care. So if you look at hospice care and you think, well, who would do, who would benefit from hospice? It doesn't have to be somebody dying and it absolutely doesn't have to be someone who's going to die within six months, okay? Now, so for example, there's a, a student in my class whose uh, brother had pancreatitis, right? It was caused by a gallstone stuck in the common bile duct and it was very severe, so severe that this man spent about two years in and out of a hospital. During his crazy stays in the hospital, at some point he qualified for palliative care, meaning comfort care. Stop checking the vital signs every 15 minutes, right? It's comfort care. It, he had at no point a terminal disorder. He was not given a DNR. He was not a DNI. He was just comfort care until he could heal up.
He had um, dialysis, he had a colostomy bag, he had pressure ulcers that needed caring for, he had dietary issues that were a big deal, he had lots of pain, and this required palliative care, not hospice. So I kind of want you to know the difference for basic care and comfort, because they're popular on basic care and comfort questions. All right, wound and incision care. Patient has a C-section, you better understand that basic care and comfort is recognition of whether or not that incision is healing properly. And we always teach you straw, right? We teach you the little mnemonic of straw and straw, S-T-R-A-W. S is for swelling, T is for tenderness, the R is for redness, the A, here, the A is for antibiotics possibly needed, and the W is for warmth. In other words, any wound, incision, ulcer should be evaluated for straw. And by the way, any incision or wound or ulcer that you are trying to care for should be improving and healing within two weeks. It may still be healing after that, but you should notice a distinct change within those two weeks. Um, so this is kind of like a big deal, right? The wound and incision care, because everybody's got a wound, everybody's got an incision. There's a lot of shit going on around here with the surgeries and whatnot. You gotta be on your shit, okay? Now, a big basic care and comfort area is DVT prevention. If you said that the way you prevent DVTs in your patient is to give them a heparin shot, 5,000 units of heparin every day, you failed that part of the test. No, boo, the way to prevent DVT is ambulate that patient within six hours of surgery. Oh yeah, that's big, that's huge, because the number one person that's at risk for DVT is a surgical patient. The other part of making sure we prevent the DVT is elevating the limbs above the level of the heart to enhance that venous return. Another tip for DVT prevention is TED hose. Maybe it's SCDs, sequential compression devices. Whatever it is, you better know it ain't heparin on your test. Okay, you feeling me on that? Moving on, a big one, probably the number one area of basic care and comfort is your respiratory patient. It's called pulmonary toileting. Sometimes it's called pulmonary hygiene. What is it? Well, it's basically almost like 10 things you do for the respiratory patient who is either, you know, decompensating or um, deteriorating. What can you do besides sit there and figure out, should I call the doctor or not? Well, you can do pats and claps, which is called chest physiotherapy. You could administer bronchodilators, which even though that's a medicine, that is a basic care and comfort because it's gonna help this guy open the airway. You can absolutely try suctioning your patient. Here's another one, have them cough and deep breathe. Also, are you hydrating them enough to loosen up secretions so they can cough them out? That would be hydration issue, right? But it's still part of pulmonary toileting. Um, you can change their position. If they're sitting back in semi fowlers, then by all means, lift them up in high fowlers. I work in an out, in a, um, endoscopy unit. And so when we notice that the patient who's undergoing an endoscopy, their pulse ox is dropping, we do a simple chin lift. You wouldn't think that that would be that big a deal, but it actually works really, really well. It's not like I can wake them up and say, hey, boo, cough and deep breathe. No, that's not gonna happen. So I'm doing a chin lift to help them, you know, oxygenate themselves, uh, administer oxygen, whatever. That's all basic care and comfort. Incentive spirometers, all that stuff is part of basic care and comfort. Here's one you might not think of, you guys. Hearing and vision impaired, right? So when your patient is hearing impaired, then you know you're gonna have to face them and hopefully stand by a window where they can see your lips and read your lips, correct? You know that you're not going to raise your voice to the hearing impaired, because that does not help. You know that you're gonna have to possibly find a sign language 
interpreter to help this patient understand what you're saying. You know that you might need a graph board or something to write out what you're trying to say to them. You understand that the patient's hearing aid should be in their ear to maximize whatever hearing they have left. I mean, you kind of know this, but you might not have known that when you miss the answer for a question on hearing impairment, that was basic care and comfort, the number one area of failure. Vision impairment, you know, that all the lights must be on, you know the distractors need to be off, like the television, you know that as you guide the patient to ambulate, that you're walking in front of them and they are a little bit behind you on the side and their arm, their hand is holding your arm and you're leading them, you know that, you already know that. So these are things that I don't know. I think, you know, sometimes when you go to nursing school, they skip over all this shit, but you got to know it. Okay. Visitors and family. Oh, did you know, for example, that in terms of emergency admissions, especially like for things like trauma, maybe a very bad motorcycle accident, did you know that family can stay in the room during the chest tube insertion, uh, if it's the patient coding, they literally can stay in there and see you guys run a code blue. I know that sounds bizarre, but family is better in the room than out of the room. And kicking visitors out is not what you should be doing. And I know many nurses are anti-visitors, but that's stupid because actually your patient heals better when their family and their friends are with them. And frankly, their family and their friends do a lot for us to make our lives a little easier. That's been my experience anyway, especially if you're the type of nurse that teaches the family what they could do to help out for their mom. And, you know, they're helping their mom, but reality is they're helping me be a better nurse. So I don't understand why you nurses get so worked up. Let me just tell you a secret. I did my residency in Detroit, Michigan at Hudson Hospital when I went for my nurse midwifery. I know, crazy, right? I'm, side note, I'm an OBGYN nurse midwife for 20 years, retired. But anyway, I did my residency at Hudson Hospital. They deliver 10,000 babies a year. Do you know they had a, a policy that there was no visiting hour policy? So when I got there and I heard there's no visiting hour policy, I was like, really? So anybody could show up in this woman's room with her legs all open and her sun and her moon showing and no blanket or sheets on and pushing, pooping, all that stuff that happens during the delivery of a baby? Really? They said, oh yeah. I said, that's cool, I think. I mean, like, what about the neighbor across the street? I mean, like, I don't get it. So here's what they said to me and I got it. Back in those days when I did my residency, they said, and I quote, we don't want to get shot, so we're not trying to fight with no visitors. If they want to be in the room and the mama want them in the room, so be it. Go on and knock it out. Do your thing. And guess what? It works, and it actually has been no big deal. So there I was for three months doing my residency, delivering babies at a very busy hospital with the neighbor, the cousin and them, the uh, mama and the daddy, uh, the baby daddy. Everybody in mama law was in the room. Didn't matter. We had a great time. It's actually really, really cool because very few nurses fed the baby. Usually the family helped mom feed the baby. It's really cool. I liked it. So keep it moving. This is huge. If you're in my class in Ohio, you already know that when I do a case study with you and I say that this patient speaks some other language, you know that your highest priority, as <laughs> long as ain't nobody dying, is to get an interpreter because how are you giving informed consent without them understanding what the hell you're talking about? So an interpreter is very high on the prioritization list with a patient that does not speak the language. Otherwise, you don't really have informed consent. So that should help. And you are not using family to translate. Remember that. Sign language I kind of covered. Okay, so we can move on. The last column of... How does a nurse pass basic care and comfort on her NGN NCLEX exam? The last column has to do with the number one way that nurses differ from all other professions in medicine. Every opportunity you have 
with your patient should be a teaching experience. Whether you're giving an IV medication and you're pushing it over two minutes slowly, whether or not you're flushing the IV, whether you're administering medications, changing a wound dressing, whether you're ambulating them, whether you're going and helping them go to the bathroom. Um, hey, no matter what it is, it's an opportunity that they have you face-to-face -face in their room and you can do some teaching and teaching should be happening constantly. Teaching is what makes us different. And you already knew that. You knew, for example, when the, when the doctor comes in or the nurse practitioner comes in and says, from the looks of the biopsy and the labs that we've taken and reviewed, it does look like you have stage three cancer um, of the pancreas. And we're going to be scheduling you for chemo, radiation, um, we're probably going to do another biopsy or two of this and that. And you're going to be scheduled with the oncologist in the morning to talk over what to do with them. As soon as that provider leaves that room, as soon as it happens, the patient is going to look at you and go, what did he just say? Well, what does that mean? Well, so like, like cancer for real? Like... What's oncology? What, what's chemo? Like, what do they do with chemo? Like, what did he mean by radiation? I never heard of that. I mean, that's all we do is teach. What are the two focus areas on your NCLEX exam? We're teaching better be the, you know, when you do that question, it better be the right answer for basic care and comfort. They're going to put you at seminars, um, conferences. They're going to say you're doing a seminar on obesity you're doing a seminar on prevention of breast cancer you're doing a seminar on screening for all cancers you're doing a seminar on GERD you're doing a seminar for weight reduction surgeries that's huge that's going to be a basic care and comfort question or pre-op your patient's about to have surgery what are some of the most important things to teach them before they undergo surgery? Like cough and deep breathe, like ambulate within six hours after major surgery. Like if they have a procedure like an endoscopy or a colonoscopy, ambulating will get rid of the gas pain. The more they get up and move, the more the gas pain disappears. Teaching, pre-op. We're almost done. IV therapy is a big, huge, outrageous, ridiculous, crazy basic care and comfort area. You have to know that that IV is looked at every hour. You have to know what phlebitis looks like. You have to understand that infiltration is very different. You know that with phlebitis, you're going to use warm compresses. You know that with infiltration, cool compresses might work better. You know that extravasation is just infiltration of medication. I'll say that again. The difference between infiltration and extravasation is that extravasation is infiltration of a medication, whereas infiltration is just fluids. So you got to know this stuff. This is a huge area, a huge, um, I would say a huge focus of basic care and comfort spirituality and cultures right so i told you that my pink packets have like all this crap in it already so let me just real quick show you the whole iv area of my procedures or reduction of risk packet so if you look in here this is a packet full of lovely procedures and inside of here, when I was talking about the whole infiltration, extravasation, phlebitis, and all the rest of the crap that goes with it, these are the fluids. So I don't know if you can see, but these are all the different types of fluids. Here's the different types of problems that can go wrong with an IV. There's lots of IV information. This whole page is central lines so we cover everything you need to know for basic care and comfort in there but then you have spirituality and cultures 
and I told you before, this one has a lot of what you need. I even have a page in here that talks about the cultures and religions. So you'll get the Judaism, Seventh Day at Venice, you'll get the Catholic, the Christian, you'll get all that stuff in there, Islamic faith, everything. Splints, crutches, walkers, blah, 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 right? What is that called? Adaptive devices. Assistive, adaptive. Adaptive, assistive. Assistive, adaptive, adaptive, assistive. But whatever. That is what you got to know. You got to know how to teach the walker, how to teach the crutches, how to teach the cane. Those are freaking huge under basic care and comfort. You also have to know how to treat a splint or a strain with rice. What the hell is rice? R. What is R? I don't know, Shelly. I think it's, uh, yeah, you better know. You better know what rice is. I'm not here to give you all the answers, but I bet you better know what rice is. Okay? Okay? All right. Rest ice, compression, and elevation. Now keep it moving. Here we go. Pain management, uh-oh, non-pharmacologic, O-M-G. Yes, pain management includes medications, and yes, that is part of basic care and comfort, but for pain that is chronic, you better know that there's other answers to that question. What kind of pain is chronic? osteoarthritis. What other pain is chronic? Rheumatoid arthritis. What other pain is chronic? Um, neuropathies, all this stuff. Um, uh, migraines, right? So let's give you an example of chronic pain management. Warm compresses, cool compresses, uh, decreased anxiety with aromatherapy, um, clean linen, uh, tens unit to the back for back pain because uh, back pain can be very chronic dietary measures for migraines how about that huh so you can't just grab the damn Imatrex or go get you some Motrin people got GI bleeds they use a Motrin so much all right well I got a few more I hope you're standing there with me rehabilitation and long-term care is very much basic care and comfort especially for who? Strokes, spinal cord injury, Alzheimer's patients, because you need to know how to not reach for medication, but how to use your basic nursing care with these types of clients. Like, if you think about a stroke patient, are you aware what side to put their pants on with relationship to which side is weak and, and, and paralyzed? Do you know the best way to teach them how to eat do you understand the aphasias, expressive aphasia, BRCA's aphasia with regards to Alzheimer's patients? How do you deal with sundowning on your unit? How do you avoid restraints and get this patient in a situation where they're not wandering or trying to elope the unit? All of that is basic care and comfort. Enteral feedings. This is your tube feedings, your pegs, your NG. You have to know how to unblock them, get the blocked tube feedings unblocked. You have to understand the latest in caring for a patient with these feeding tubes. Um, it's huge, right? It's a big deal. It's part of nutrition too. And then last but not least, check this out. Once again, oh my God. All of your precautions are basically included in basic care and comfort. So if you look at this page, I did select alls that apply in all of your precautions. Are you looking? There is your bleeding precautions. You go down a little bit more, you have seizure precautions. You have your ICP or pressure precautions. On the other side, the biggest one, the one you better know the best, is your neutropenic precautions. Then if you look a little bit closer, there's that stroke patient with dysphagia precautions. And lastly, suicidal precautions. 
again, nurses, all of those precautions are what you do, not the doctor. It's not the doctor that's going to work with the stroke patient when they first begin to try to eat and tell them to flex their chin versus extending their chin. If you just do it with me, you can't even swallow when your head is like this. You can only swallow when your head is like this. It's not gonna be the doctor that knows when the tray comes up from cafeteria that this whole cornbread is not appropriate for the dysphagia patient. It's not the doctor that's gonna understand to decrease the distractions, turn the TV off and make sure that the patient is alert and sitting straight up and left straight, sitting straight up after the meal for 30 minutes and is allowed 30 full minutes to digest this meal. It's not a doctor, it's a nurse. Okay, so that is what I want for you. I want for you to understand through these three columns your role in basic care and comfort and how you know that's the number one area of failure. And just maybe this video helped a little bit. Soon to come and will be available in our Shelly's NCLEX Prep Shop for Purchase will be a basic care and comfort packet or handout. Stay tuned. I love you. You should know that by now. Deuces.